like to call the Athens City Planning Commission to order. All of the commissioners are here, so we have established quorum. Uh, if there's anyone that would like to speak at today's meeting, I do ask that you stand up now. Do you affirm to, uh, or and swear to tell the truth to this commission? Yes. Thank you. you. May be seated, and we can begin. The first uh, case is number 09-07, uh, Julie Garner, uh, 4770 Fisher Road, a lot split. Uh, is Julie Garner here to speak? Yeah. Uh, would you like to address um, the commission, just sort of, I guess, basically say what, what um, um, defining that lot split, and then I know. Uh, you can either sit at the table or at the podium, and then uh, our planner will sort of follow suit and, uh, with more explanation. And if you, if you don't like to, you can also have the planner speak for you if he <laughs> has enough information. She wasn't really explaining. She okay. wasn't planning to talk. Were, were you planning? If you weren't, I mean, it's fine if uh, the planner can. I guess that's another way to do it. Well, I can answer questions. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, if, um, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? I do. Okay. Thank you. And, and Paul, if you don't have, if she doesn't need to have any input, that's fine too. It's just if questions come up. It's I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to let Mr. Paskey handle this. John. Okay. John communicated with Ms. Garner the entire process. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a pretty clear cut project as far as an approval on it, at least in my opinion. But I'll, I'll allow John to cover that with you. All right, thank you. Yes, it's a simple lot split. Uh, the reason it's here is because it's in the three mile radius, um, but it does uh, meet the road frontage with the depth ratio and the engineer's approval and the health department has signed off on it. Um, the only reason it's here is because it's less than five acres. If it was more than it would be a cut and dry piece of property. So since it's less than five, it has to go through planning commission according to our code. So your recommendation is to approve the lots yes. I take it. Okay. Is there any questions from commissioners then? Okay, so basically everybody's in favor of it. Uh, there's no problem with this. Yeah, Great. and, and uh, <coughs> Paul, Paul Logue, you, you had a chance to review this as well, right? Uh, I, I did review it. It meets, uh, it meets all the requirements for the lot split. The important thing for, uh, at least in my mind, the most important thing when we're dealing with a lot split in the three mile limits, but outside of the city of Athens, is that the health department has reviewed it and approved it. They have. Um, Chuck Hammer from the health department signature is right here on top of that survey. Uh, they had no problems with it, so it does, it, it meets the county's requirements. County engineer also, they've reviewed it for accuracy. So there's, uh, I don't see what there any complications or problems would be with approving it. Okay. Well, is there any uh, discussion on the part of the commissioners then, or otherwise we'll take this to a vote? I move that we accept the, uh, uh, my, the lot split of this. Uh, Second. All those in favor? Okay. Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. you. The next uh, case on our agenda is number 08-13, uh, Diversified Properties, Madison Heights, uh, proposed change on that project that we had previously seen. Uh, again, if you're going to be uh, uh, talking during this case, please either take a seat at the table or, the po or stand at the podium. Um, since we've uh, seen, I don't know how, uh, the best way to approach this might be to have uh, you guys sort of reintroduce this since we probably will not make a vote, I imagine, today since we're all sort of seeing this, but you never know. So. Uh, you'd like to go ahead and represent this, the, present the change to commission, please go ahead. Very good, thank you. I'm Jim Bloom from Diversified Properties. Uh, this is in regard to Madison Heights, a residential development that Diversified Properties uh, has been working on since 2005. Uh, we have had more than one uh, development concept and approval. Uh, actually three, I believe, at this point. Uh, and a lot of those concepts have been originally directed, uh, at least in our minds, based on our interpretation of the, comp the Athens Comprehensive Plan and what we, uh, what we think is a local consumer need. Uh, the current plan, which was approved, uh, and I believe when I say approved all the way through council pending 
the final plat being produced and signed uh, featured seven detached residences. Um, again, uh, we are, I don't have the dates in front of me, but that was a fully approved That's through right. the Planning Commission and City Council. Um, during the uh, course of that investigation, we've had what I would characterize as continuous communication with the city uh, regarding the complexities of the infrastructure, location, connection, and development. And only recently have these issues been fully resolved and actual engineering drawings are in the hands right now of the appropriate city agencies. Those have been delivered to the city. Um, the, des the change, or I would call it, and I'll be specific, the minor alteration or not substantial change, I will characterize it as, is to take the five detached residences that are on the upper portion of the property and mass them uh, in, two, in a two unit and a three unit building as opposed to the five independent pieces. And that's a direct conclusion of the finalization of this infrastructure issue, which has really driven the majority of the development. It's a, uh, for those of you that don't know directly, it's a, a concise area that we are attempting to develop appropriately. The installation of uh, city utilities, uh, water, sewer, and storm sewer, as well as AEP, uh, is in a very defined area. There's not a lot of wiggle room, would be the way I would characterize it. Uh, as this infrastructure development became finalized, we took a second look and said, you know, any room we could buy by making a minor alteration is going to allow for candidly easier installation and access to these utilities, as well as, uh, you know, the circulation on the site has always been challenging from day one. This buys us a little bit more room uh, in one corner, as John will share with you when you go over the actual drawings with him. Uh, the result of this minor alteration uh, is the floor plans of each of the five residences will virtually be identical to what is already approved. Square footage commensurate, if not almost identical, style to what has currently been approved. Um, and again, as I I'm going to reiterate increased circulation capacity, a bit of additional room to develop uh, the required infrastructure. Infrastructure will result. And as an aside, we believe that the final design alteration will translate into uh, increased affordability to the to the Athens consumer. Uh, now for our opinion. <laughs> It is our opinion that this is not a substantive change to the approved plan, especially since the final plat has yet to be generated. The spirit size, style, and end product is virtually identical to the approved residences with the obvious change that we've masked them in a two and a three unit building. Uh, we ask the commission to recognize this development has uh, been fully and completely scrutinized in every detail and all aspects, uh, as, as many of the commission members are probably sorry to see us here, and uh, ask that we can move forward with the preparation of our final plat with this minor alteration. Do you want to share with them? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything in front of you as far as that? Uh, we just have the uh, sort of showing the ex what was originally accepted to the change of the silhouettes. 
see. This here is the original plan here. Okay. okay. And this is the revised plan, which highlights it in yellow, and I'll show you the floor plans in a second. Um, obviously, the main flower shop location, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And the small carriage house for the garage, is, nothing has changed. Then we have, you know, this very vegetated, pretty severe hillside right here. And then up top, we have five residences. And up here now we have the five residences. You can see what we've done is this area here inside this curve, which it constricts. We basically turn it all into green space mm -hmm. and allow for all this to remain because this is a little bit tight coming through here. We're allowing all of this to just remain as is by massing these buildings, which kind of obviously clustered them together. And we've bought a little bit of space at the top of the bridge here between that what and the, the title? back of the building to uh, allow for access. Once again, I'm just forgetting, forgetting what Jim said. Uh, dealing with uh, Andy and uh, all the powers that be trying to get the water, the sewer, the electric, everything back in there. There's not a lot of, of room. So my idea was to try to just, you know, shorten this footprint a little bit and mass it a little bit differently and try to avoid some of this constriction here. <coughs> get us through that spot there because there's not a lot of room there. So you're saying the square footage is uh, essentially the same for each of these buildings? or? I'll get, yeah, it's okay. about, And I assume because they're linked buildings, there's probably some kind of firewall differences or something like that. Yeah, well, we, we have a, a drawing that we submit, which will show how the unit is se units are separated. It's a standard airspace, uh, certain kind of a fire in drywall, which goes in between the okay. units. We've done it a lot. Yeah. Um, this particular plan here, which I'll let you try to take a peek at is the approved plan. I'll just lay it down right here. And that plan, the, uh, the two main floors of this plan have about uh, 1,520 or 30 square feet. The new plan has about 1,570 square feet. So it's uh, it's just a uh, two or three percent different, and that's just got to do with the way when we mass them have a wall around that. Okay. If you look at the new plan, you can see just by a quick overview the linear nature of the plan is is the same. I'm going to just point to the center, which is the first floor. You've got the same garage here. You've got the foyer. You've got the stairway the half bath, the kitchen, the, the eating area, and the living room. So it's, it's the same plan. Upstairs you've got two bedrooms here and here. And in between the two bedrooms you've got basically a massing of two more bathrooms, closets, washer dryer room, etc. Okay, I don't see any difference. Yeah, I don't understand. This, is, yeah. this is also approved, that says approved. Are we looking at different things? Okay, this one right there. Okay. Looks like you have two copies. Why don't we shoot one over that way? This is the this is the old, this is the old, that's the new. Okay, great. Okay, there you go. Because I see the differences, the bump out between there and there. Right, you just kind of. Fifteen seventy-eight square feet, fifteen twenty. Very very close. This just turned out to be a, which is nice, a little bit larger uh, because the lines line up. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's identical. The actual footprint of the, but this is actually a little bit nicer as, as it relates to the, the foyer here, mm -hmm. a little bit more mm -hmm. comfortable. Um, yeah, kind of that and really what we're seeing is the example of the, the middle one for this one. Is that what I'm looking at? Because the only difference would be the windows, I assume, on other sides, right. outside, inside. Mm -hmm. And the, the reality of the five units was that the buildings were separated, but they were so close together mm. that 
They weren't that close. Right? Uh, about that's a typical mm -hmm. city. They're about 14 feet. Mm -hmm. Pretty close. Mm -hmm. How many people, I wasn't on the uh, commission when you first came in, how many people were proposed to be in each of like the units one through five versus now? The same. Same. Everything's the same. Okay. Driveways are the same, walkways are the same, surface area of the roof is the same. Um, Does the consolidation uh, diminish the uh, desirability on the part of the young professionals that you, know, you originally you know, versus what looks to be more of an academic type of... No, I, I think it's going to enhance it, actually. Uh, because because in reality, these are so close Pardon together. Pardon me? Do they have those up there? Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. John, do they have these? John, do they have these? I'd like to address that issue, if I could, regarding that desirability issue. I think at the end of the day, the location and one of the reasons that we have moved at a slow pace on this development is it's as great a residential location as there is to be developed in the city of Athens. And we believe that one of the enhancements of this okay. alteration is going to be at the end of the day, more affordability for the buyer. So and I think- look, This is gonna look more like your project on Herald, a little bit? In the, in the sense that it's attached. Yeah. In the sense that it's attached, yeah. But uh, we think it'll be a desire, because of the desirability of the location, the amenities are virtually identical to what we approved as, as uh, the detached residences that, uh, we do think it'll be desirable. Obviously, that's you know our motivation. Um, can I ask you a question? Just off the, the path there, as far as the traffic flow. Originally, I think you had the traffic being able to go both ways, all around. Did you uh, redesign that to where there would just be one flow to answer the concerns that people had about the <coughs> the bottom entrance of Madison? Paula, do you remember? <laughs> I think mm, the final thing was we're going to have a no left turn sign out, and that's what I believe council ultimately no, yeah. did. Mm. Yeah. So. No, yeah, yeah, at the bottom, on the, on the, the bottom. Yes, on the, on the bottom, no left, left turn. That was the resolution because an adjacent neighbor had a concern about their ability to get in and out and park in their designated parking area that they own. That's how we came to that resolution. Right. Plus, I, plus, I had heard from a number of residents who use that hill that that uh, that might be kind of a dangerous uh, exit area, so close to the uh, sure. stop sign to the intersection. And, and I believe that's how that resolution okay, evolved. Great. Was the, uh, I'm curious. Was that 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 would be a new addition, right? The no left turn. It's not like the current the Athens Flower Shop was not allowed to make left turns. Patrons. Correct. Mm -hmm. so, I think the concern was that was brought up at the council level. Okay, three. that's yeah, right. Because I, I don't remember that at the commission. No, it was so. at, okay. the council started. Saw, uh, two considerations of the council at the time were um, one is the uh, the elevation of the upper uh, exit egress mm -hmm. where there was the slope was too high. Yeah. And the other one was whether there would be a, what kind of flow was going to be happening, circular okay. or otherwise. Yeah, I know right. the elevation issue was brought up here too. So. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, really what you're asking is that uh, this just be uh, kind of like uh, approved, I guess, along the way. Um, I do know that there have been some changes. I believe uh, we want to speak, have uh, Jessica Dine, the okay. manager, project and development manager, speak, say a few words. Um, I imagine that some of this, uh, I noticed that the first drawing that you gave us has, um, and I'm probably stealing her thunder there, uh, <laughs> locations of the water lines, and I assume that has changed uh, somehow, or? Was that part of the part you, of the infrastructure? Was why you say infrastructure changes? You you yes. have, I believe, in your hands the most current engineering drawings for the infrastructure. Okay. Okay. So that is as those, those are prepared to be submitted to the EPA. I mean that is ready to go as as to be built. Okay. And I think Jessica can speak to why this all developed regarding utilities. 
I'm just gonna, if you would go to the podium, there's trying to be enough space for you at the table today. And introduce yourself for, for the world. <laughs> Andy Stone and I reviewed these, and I have some general comments about them. Um, Andy's comments were the general alignment of the utilities is okay, but we have some questions and concerns about the easement, specifically the easement width and the direction of the easement, that we would like to see the, um, the easement be able to match either into right-of-way or an existing easement or match the property lines better. So. That we could allow for future condition. Are you talking about the the, uh, the driveway easement or the utility? The utility. Okay. Okay, that's the one I'm trying to follow you. Okay. Um, and I can show you. Can and show also show. On, on this right here. So we've extended this. We were asked to extend this so you could get. So this could come into the right away. Yes. And Andy Stone's comments. He would like to see this either match into an existing right of way or into another easement or perhaps transition up to meet the property line better to allow the future connection. Just the easement. Right. Not the, the, the easement. Just the easement, yeah. not, not right. the entire utility. I was going to say, the last thing we want to do is tear up the. Uh, no, no, no. This would just be to have. So the city can have an easement there in case we need to expand additional infrastructure in there. Well, yeah, we, we were told that originally, and that's why we did that. If, if you wanted to, at some point, be more specific about exactly what kind of alignment you're talking about, we can we can incorporate that. But, you know, we, we were under that understanding that you wanted us to not just terminate that last manhole, but to allow for future connection if you wanted to. Not a problem. Um, other things that um, we would like to see is your on site storm drainage plan. I'm sorry, Can I could speak louder. Yeah. Can you speak up? Yes. Yeah. Um, we would need to see your on site storm drainage plan for the property. We, I, I discussed that with Andy and et cetera in the field, and we've located where it is on Madison. And the idea is when they were going to bring up the, the sewer, we would extend that storm and, and have it parallel right out there. And okay. then we would bring our, our storm water into that. Okay, we'll need to review the, a plan sheet for more details. Okay. And then the road access plan, which isn't part of the utilities, but we'll need to review that. The road access plan? Yes. Which I know wasn't submitted as part of this, but. We don't know what that is. This is uh, the first time we've heard any of these I things, think, so I, it's I interesting. I think they're asking for a maintenance of traffic flow. Oh, we were, on how, how the, how they approach how the driveway is going to access onto Madison. Both driveways? Right. The, Would this just be a site plan? The, that's yes. on the site plan yeah, already. Yeah. I mean, the, dri the driveways are called out on the site plan mm -hmm. to the existing roadway that... that as, long, as long as the driveway access as it exists on the Approved. 2008 approved site plan yeah. hasn't okay. changed. It's exactly. We could have Andy review that just to confirm it, but it should, I don't exactly think as it's it been. should be fine. <clears throat> it was reviewed back in 2008. I'm sure for Andy, it's just not fresh in his mind. I, that's probably all. So I'll make that note and take that back to Andy. But. I had thought you were going to speak to the whole utility discussions that were carried on this summer just to kind of confirm what they're indicating the developers were in, met with Andy multiple times, and yes, the, the, the space <coughs> is so limited that this is what's had to happen. You have to get, what, the 10-foot separation, according to EPA, between sewer and what, and it just became a little too challenging, which is why this reconfiguration has occurred to align with what we're requiring in terms of the utilities. So. Yeah. 
That is correct. I was present. Andy and I were present with uh, diversified properties for those discussions, and there was a significant issue with where the layout for the older buildings were proposed, where they were encroaching further towards East State Street. Um, there was not enough room to get all of the utility put into that section. Um, and so after continuous discussions between them and Public Works, uh, this was a proposal to bring it back so that they do have enough room to get their utilities installed as meets city code. Uh, but to do that, they had to push the buildings back, which is one of the reasons that the buildings now are smaller as far as from lengthwise. A little that, smaller, and obviously getting rid of that. Oh, the last building. No, I just mean allows us not having to go around that tight corner there. Um, and that'll make a nice green space. So and it'll make a big green space. So that'll be nice. All right. So what I'm understanding is that this is really just driven to allow for the utility easement. It isn't so much that you wanted to see attached buildings, which is, I mean, that's fine. I guess just explain that. We, and that's what I got from it. We had, <laughs> and we okay. had for purposes of discussion only, right. we had two different approvals previously mm -hmm. which were attached structures. Right. It was it upon so our right. motivation to bring to the commission the detached concept which we pursued the to the end. Right. Had you known what you know now, you probably would have stuck with had, it. <laughs> you can fill in the blanks had we known what we right. know now, fill right. that in. But, understand. Uh, again, the project has been significantly scrutinized for four years. Uh, and, you know, this change we think is a positive change for the project, for the outcome. And we're just trying to uh, get to the next level with hopefully not, you know, we're, we're not excited about starting at square one. I'll be candid. Right. Okay. I'll just be candid about that. We just need recognition of what this change really means to the, to the commission and the council and then act accordingly. Any comments from commissioners? Um, so really the question is whether this is significant enough to actually mm -hmm. start from square one and, and continue or just say the modified um, plan year development is adequate and uh, as long as they will the, the final plan is put together in accordance to what the public works wants. Mm -hmm. Is that what? That's my understanding. Anyone else's uh, take? I assume they do they need a review to council again? That's another question. Mayor. Uh, if I may, yes, uh, just please. to make sure we're clear, Title 21 of Athens City Code Subdivision Regulations for Planned Unit Developments, uh, 2109-26 states that a conceptual or fundamental change to the site plan shall be in accordance with the procedure outlined in the approval process. That's it. 2109-26? Uh, uh, Correct. Very last sentence. Of okay, that. conceptual, yeah. So in interest of moving this along, um, which means if we can get a vote today, then it can be presented uh, through the council uh, process, mm -hmm. I would move to approve the modifications to submit to council with the, on the condition that the easement, storm drainage, and road access plan are reviewed and accepted. Paula, uh, would, would we need to approve it with a recommendation for a variance because PUDs are supposed to be larger than two acres as well. That was so initially one of the approvals, the yes. so just in case. <laughs> Can I amend that to yeah. include the, the recommendation second. for yeah. variance uh, because of the size? I think so. <laughs> I guess where my uh, confusion, and I think we're all a little confused in a sense, is I think it all has, a lot of it has to do with responsibility. Whose responsibility for knowing that 10-foot easement was there when the site plan was originally conceived? Was it the city's responsibility? Was it AP's responsibility? Or was it the developer's responsibility? I would just say that the utilities have been challenging on this project from the beginning. They really have. Mm -hmm. We've gone from tying in from East State, tying in off of Madison, 
And the developers have worked very closely with engineering and public works to f get this finalized. So. I, I guess, yeah, where I'm, I'm leaning, I don't see this as a conceptual or fundamental change to the project. It's, if it's moving buildings closely together and back a little bit, I mean, I think it's still the same project. I mean, it's just was being altered due to that easement. I, in other words, if they were to move the road 10 feet, that would then qualify as a fundamental and perceptual change in this reading. Even if they weren't to move any of the buildings but move their e easement from the site plan, that would qualify as that, if we were to read it that way. So I, I, I guess I'm sort of, I don't know if I see it as a, a fundamental change. Does this obviously, does it move it back closer to the houses that uh, are owned above the Excuse site? me? Do, do these structures then move closer to the homes that are located above? There are no homes above. There's just no, the no, road exists, okay. and the driveways come off of there. It's okay. a completely vegetated area. There's no houses. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, I am very, I've been doing this 30 years. I'm very sensitive to topography, changing grade, and the realities of this type of construction. And that's what's driving some of this, because I know when we get down and dirty into this, what I don't want to do is disturb this hillside. Mm -hmm. And I know what it takes to put utilities in, get the job done uh, in, in a manner that we're not going to disturb the uh, this vegetated area. Okay. The reality is, you're not even, not even going to see what we're talking about here from East State Street. All right. I'm just talking in regards to that one house that's tucked up on the hill back away from Madison. Yeah, you guys just, yeah that might, maybe, it's, maybe it's further away than I thought. It, mu it, it must be, yeah. Uh, you can't see anything. Okay. And they go farther back. Okay, so what was the motion? I, I've placed a motion. What was the motion again? My motion, <laughs> but, you know, know Nicholas is throwing me a curveball. I, I apologize. <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, planner, the question before the commission that Nicholas has brought in is he does not, he is not viewing it as a conceptual change or a fundamental change. Trying to do this the best process. Yeah. That is a good question. I, I would say conceptual or fundamental may be, it could be argued either way. Um, still the same amount of units, still the same, similar, still same, going to be condominiums, still mm -hmm. going to be the same use, still the same amount of bedrooms, et cetera. Um, whether clustering buildings together as opposed to having them separated out, that's really the only change. Whether that's a conceptual or a fundamental change, I could be persuaded either way on it. I suppose. Um, I do, personal, from a personal perspective, I don't think it's a significant change to what was initially proposed. Uh, I, I would say, at a minimum, we should probably have City Council review it to make sure that City Council is on the same page. It is still City Council's responsibility to approve the final plat. And if council has not reviewed these changes prior to a final plat being brought forward to them, it may actually be encouraging the developers to do a lot of work and spending a lot of money on plans to only find out that city council views it as a conceptual or fundamental change on their end. So mm -hmm. I don't see why the planning commission, if you guys so choose, could vote to approve it today and refer it back to city council to review it. If City Council wants to do it down and, and suspend rules and do one ordinance on it or something, and then still have the requirements for a final plat, that would be their prerogative, but that would certainly make sense to me, just to at least make sure that all anybody who has the authority to approve has at least reviewed the ch these changes. If it was a change of uh, you know moving a window around or something like that, I don't see where it would be an, an, have an impact that could not just be addressed at the final plat. Um, Paul, that's me, though. Oh, Paul, I'm sorry. Paul, do you and Paul feel as though this is an improvement, this plan is an improvement on the utility <clears throat> layout? From the conversations with Andy that he's had with the developers, yeah. I do think as far as getting the utilities installed in the proper manner, uh, this should help it. Uh, Andy is going to be preparing a memo on this uh, very shortly so that everybody's clear on that. Uh, that would always... And that's always something that we probably will have to address utilities again at some point with this project once it's all said and done as well. So 
never know what's going on underneath until you actually tear it up. Okay. All right. Thank you for your input. Sure. Paul, would you reread your motion? Because it sounds like we'd still probably stay at an unlikely. I make a motion that uh, the Planning Commission approve and recommend to Council the, this latest modification pending um, with the conditions and a variance, let me get this right, from the acreage size, that condition that uh, the easement for the utility line, storm drainage plan, and, and road access is reviewed with uh, Andy Stone, our city engineer and director of public works. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, well, thank you, gentlemen. Hopefully this is... Next step would be by City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've now uh, we've finished our cases for the day. We can move on to the communications. I just I need to repeat those because it's yeah, just just make sure once it's you know I think okay. I think the concern will be with this site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our first communication on the agenda uh, with Shard uh, uh, is Mike Smeltzer either in attendance or has he provided a letter to the commission? Okay. 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 Well, we will uh, skip that item for now. And uh, wait a second. There are some people who want to oh, speak. Oh, sorry. Um, my apologies. Uh, would like to uh, speak once the table is cleared out. Please uh, step up, or you can use the, choose to use the podium. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> if you would uh, state your name uh, to the commission, uh, John Wharton. Okay. I um, am here today, I guess it was on your agenda, I was told, Mr. Smelter's request. Yeah, it, we had just uh, received news this morning that he was not going to be attendance, but he was in all likelihood to drop off a letter. We have not received that letter, so we don't really have... I'm his letter. Oh, you, you're his letter. <laughs> yeah. well, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Talking okay. telegram here. A um, little history on, I guess, why I'm here. Um, I apologize to Mr. Kashigi. Um, I think it's been starting in the early 90s. Uh, you've been on the Planning Commission since then, I think, um, where um, this is actually this topic has been addressed. This would be the fifth time, I think. Uh, the rezoning of the northern block of the uptown area to um, conform with the rest of the uptown area as a B2D. Um, I brought it through the Planning Commission or to the Planning Commission just five years ago maybe, I guess, four or five years ago. And so I'm pretty familiar with the pluses and the minuses, the differences between um, where I was, B2D and B3. Uh, the downtown area, the uptown area certainly has changed over the last, uh, I guess, 20 or 30 years especially whereas uh, the northernmost block of Court Street has, in our opinion, become the most attractive block of Court Street. We have one vacancy, which is the Blue Gator. Uh, it's become a very uh, much of a retail uh, type of area between Cornwall's jewelry store moving up there 10 years ago, probably, and, and um, the import house. Um, and uh, Court Street Collections and uh, other types, similar types of retail businesses. Obviously, Stevens has since moved into the Seven Sauces, former location. Um, and um, we rented some office space on the corner, which is now occupied by um, Jeff Paddock. And then about three or four years ago, I was involved in sell selling Mr. Smeltzer the office building that he has now turned into his office building uh, and done an extensive renovation. Uh, it used to be a law office on West State Street and is now his financial planning office. 
if you've never been to it, I would encourage you to go look at it. It's the most beautiful office in, in the area, although Mr. Chaddix is very attractive as well. But um, the, um, I guess the impetus of our concern, there's advantages and disadvantages to being a B3, and there's advantages and disadvantages to being a B2D. Uh, the greatest advantage to the B2D, as far as development or developers, is you are not required to provide parking for retail or commercial space. Nothing to do with residential. You still have to provide your parking for residential, but you don't have to provide parking for your retail or commercial space. Um, as we try to find a tenant or somebody to buy the Blue Gator building, depending upon the use of the building, that becomes an issue. To have to um, provide parking requires you to, out, to go out and either get a lot within 250 feet to provide your parking or get a variance. And variances, sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. I can speak from experience. Um, so the last time I was the inspiration behind this, there was, um, I guess, a concern on some people's part that maybe somebody had visions of building the Trump Tower on the northern block of Court Street, and that, that isn't the case. Um, and because of that, there was even um, the request made by council that the Planning Commission change the height limitations in a B2D to match what it was in a B3, where they would reduce the allowable height of a building, which the Planning Commission did. Okay, so now you've made it, nobody can go up, okay? Um, I guess there was concern also about the infrastructure. You know, will the inf we have problems with the infrastructure. And if, you, if we do this, it might cause more developing to occur. And we already have problems with our infrastructure. <clears throat> I find that laughable. Um, I know you have an old tunnel that goes underneath the street, and that's a problem. But that's a problem whether there's any development up there or not, okay? I talked to Andy Stone about this, and he said, if new development occurred, they'd have to obviously tap into properly the sanitary, the stormwater, the water. You know, all that would have to be done and not dump into that tunnel. It will not further aggravate a problem that you have, okay? Can, can I interrupt you uh -huh. just for a moment? Have you spoken to the city council recently? Oh, I try not to do that. Well, I guess the I guess the question I have is the planning commission. If they voted four times to make this change, uh -huh. then what's the fifth time going to do to persuade city council? I guess you know. I guess I would give that question back to you. We have a different. I'm, I'm not on city. Well, I guess no. But I guess I guess not. What I'm saying is this. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know why after you've four times, and it wasn't this planning commission, it wasn't... No, I don't think yeah. it's maybe Harry. Har oh, Harry's the only Sorry, one, you're okay. The guilty one, then. That's why I apologize to him. I, I knew he didn't want to hear this a fifth time. <laughs> um, I guess if I was on the planning commission, quite honestly, and I had recommended this four times and council hadn't even voted on it, I'd be having discussions with city council as to why are you ignoring us? They came... Representatives of city council came to the Uptown Business Owners Association. Mm -hmm. The president of our, our, of our chamber is here. Uh, they twice came and asked, how do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. And they said, we're all for it, okay? We, we want this to happen. Our, I don't know whether it's a two hundred or $300,000 comprehensive plan that we paid for. Section 10.5 defines the Uptown area as Court Street, from President Street on the south to Carpenter Street on the north. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't understand why they haven't voted on it either, to be honest with you, okay? But I'm not the one to bring it to their attention, okay? Um, I, I know we have a new plan. I guess what now. I'm saying is we've brought it to their attention four times because mm -hmm. anytime that the Planning Commission votes, on well, because it goes City to Council it. asked Mr. Smelter to have Planning Commission revisit it again. I don't understand that. Did you know that? 
City Council asked it to be brought to the brought back to the planning <coughs> commission again. This has been like seven or eight right. months ago. Okay, well, and and unfortunately, Mr. Smeltzer had an out of trip, uh, out of out of town trip planned. Right. Today. All right, that's fine. I, it, yeah. It has not, yeah, I guess that's not what I'm getting at. I mean, it's not the messenger is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I don't know why if, um, you know, but it's Mr. Great. Hold on. Actually, <laughs> perhaps you might have a little more background from your experience and our time on city council. Has it, was it ever voted on by the planning commission during your time on the council? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know. If, uh, I think, to tell you the truth, I don't think it was, but it was, I know his previous couple mm -hmm. times and it, again a lot of it had to do with the, the scope of development there the park and commercial parking was concerned um, I think the, the discussions uh, at one point they were talking about trying to reestablish the um, distance from the parking garage a 500 foot was it radius mm -hmm. to reestablish that as a distance the, the, I think Mr. Pearson, probably about three or four years, did, did a, uh, an inventory of how many commercial lot parking spaces there were, and therefore how many could actually change over. Um, and I, I know those were some of the concerns, but um, I don't know I, I, why it didn't uh, swing over. <laughs> a lot of it has to do with, uh, okay, a lot of, okay, you mentioned the pros for B2T. What mm -hmm. are the, con uh, the, what's the cons for B2D? Uh, you, said you're, you said they're pro and con. Yeah, you, you're limited on the size of your signs. And, and when this was the initial, when I think maybe the third time it was brought to the Planning Commission or the second time, the only two objections from any property owner on that block mm -hmm. were uh, oh, yeah. Kevin Goldsberry, Goldsberry and, uh, and Jack Stoffer. Yes. Okay. And Kevin was concerned because with his sign, it would, it would no longer comply in size. And, and that was a concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and Jack's concern was that the uh, building that he owns at the barber shop was in would be limited on what uses could be, what tenants he could have. Is this coming back? Okay. So those were, yeah, I see you saying, well, yeah. Yeah, um, freestanding signs. I remember this yeah. now. And the, the business of having some mechanics in the front room where it could be seen from the window outside mm -hmm, is in a B2. Mm -hmm. There's restriction on that. And, and those two property owners are no longer opposed to this. Mm -hmm. Um, when I brought it to the Planning Commission four or five years ago, we even had like 60% of the property owners had already signed a petition that we presented where they were all in favor of it. You know, the sign, you know, see, it used to be that block of Court Street had car dealerships, gas stations, I mean, lots of them. Uh, mill milling, way back, if you look at the old pictures, uh, lives, I mean, it was like, it wasn't anything like the rest of the downtown area, okay? And, and being a past president of the Uptown Business Owners Association and being, uh, trying to be involved in the betterment of our Uptown area, I feel like we're almost a stepsister of that block. You know, we're not, we're not looked upon the same, we're not treated the same, we're being subjected to parking regulations that, that the rest of Court Street doesn't have. Uh, I mean, getting into this discussion as to, you know, changing the parking garage counting for 500 feet or less, or should we expand it or whatever, that can be a whole nother discussion on our parking and the restrictions for residential parking, okay? Um, you know, because we've obviously made strides in the last couple of years of becoming a lot more bike friendly, bike lanes, bicycle lanes, and, and uh, pedestrian friendly. And speaking as a landlord now, okay? We, we're required, though, to have a parking space for every tenant within 80 yards of their bedroom that's got to be bigger than their bedroom, okay? Well, that just sort of encourages people having cars in the downtown area, okay? What we should be doing is discouraging them from having cars and encouraging them to walk and bicycle. But that's a whole nother discussion because this really doesn't have any effect on that. This is simply saying that for retail and businesses, they're not required to have parking. Now, it does tie into that because those of us that have had to go out and create parking to satisfy our parking regulations for my offices, okay, for my businesses, that would then free up that parking. It could be used for residential. 
But, it, but my park, lots are in R3 zones. Which parking are we specifically referring to? Well, when I, when I bought my building on Court Street, which was in 99 or 2000, there had been, unfortunately, a fire at 60 North High Street uh, where a couple students died. And uh, I bought that house from the owner, and I leveled it, and I created a nine-space parking lot. And so then I deed restricted that to my building on Court Street, and that by you know doing that I was able to to oh, use okay. an okay. ugly brick building and renovate it and make it attractive. I think okay. So you're for I mean the, the only park I really can think of in that block is uh, uh, by Courtside mostly. Mm -hmm. So most of this uh, there is more on the other side. It was the H and R block side. There's some parking there off of Fern. Okay. Uh, you realize uh, Cornell Jewelers has some parking right, as well. Right. Yeah, that's. I was thinking um, that. One. Technically, <laughs> Smelzer has parking that he has right. to use for his business versus right. his residential, and half his building is residential. Mm -hmm. um, I forget. I guess we should actually go find that inventory. I, I haven't seen it in right. a couple of years, but I, I know there was a list that was made, uh, and I believe at the time, and maybe I was on council at the time, but they, they were shocked at how many park spaces were up for. Um, not, and again, the, the assumption, of course, they'll all turn into residential, but that's not, you know, that's assumed that somebody would want to give up convenient parking in front of their business right. or something like that. Right. Um, on the other hand, I, I am also aware, and this comes back to me in the discussion, is that there was also the, the, the concept that this would intensify, again, development in that area. And um, you have the North Side Neighborhood Association and members of the residents saying, saying this would only increase the noise, substantive noise and intensity of use going towards the uh, Congress, North Congress area. Mm -hmm. So I'm aware that that was one of the issues that was bandied about as well. Yeah, I think the difficult situation we find ourselves in is that we have a comprehensive plan now that wants intensity, uh, intensifying uses and densities in areas, but since this discussion probably, I, I'm sure most of the votes on the part of the Planning Commission were prior to the comprehensive plan that specifically called that out. Mm, could be almost at the same time. Yeah, so. I'm not sure. And, and to address that concern, now that there's been the restriction on height, where can development occur? Okay, I mean, look at the block. Where can development occur? You cannot go up, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if Cornwells wants to level their building and build a building there, then, then they have to provide residential parking, you know. Uh, the, all that parking's already been deed restricted to the courtside properties that's there, okay? Um, what can we, where can we go up, okay? So where, where you could possibly come up with 120 bedrooms in that block, built on top of a historical society, can't do that. How about uh, the facility next to uh, Carpenter Hall that uh, the photographer currently rents? That's not in the could zone. That, could that That's be, not in the zone. That's not in the zone. No, okay. no, it's, it's really a very limited area that we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about basically the buildings that um, abut courts or that are on Court Street from State Street to Carpenter and extending to the west on State Street over to the church, okay, mm -hmm. uh, which, which encompasses in Mr. Smelter's building. And, um, you know, then it, it goes over to the, uh, on the east over to, I think, uh, to the Malika Gall Smoke. Yeah, okay. Well, Paul can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's in your packet. There's yeah. a map in there. Yeah. It's well, a very small area, okay? I can have it in our packet. I don't see no, it. we didn't get that one. I, don't think, I think it's one of our previous packets. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, I think I did. Well, one of the four other times it was here, okay? Yes. Um, so I guess, and, and you know, I mean, to, to, to talk about trying to find a reason to not count this block or treat this block the same as the rest of the uptown area, to come back to this theoretical noise issue from the North Side Neighborhood Association. Um, Sorry, we're getting our maps together here, John. That's okay. Yep, I got it in this. We've, we've, we've had several noise ordinances passed by city council. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's been addressed as far as what they can do. If there's actually a noise violation, the police have the power to cite. Um, you know, there, there's, I mean, you know, students are going to cause noise, okay? And your most vocal concern 
I think the people that have been the most concerned about noise, um, you know, I, I guess you're going to have some noise. I, I, I tell you what, and I've said this before, what would be horrible is if you lived real close to the uptown area and it was dead silent at night, like in Lancaster or Wellston or Jackson or Chillicothe. That would be horrible, where their downtowns are dead, okay? Or Columbus, okay? Which is what they're trying to fight. They want their downtown to be alive. I guess if you really wanted true peace and quiet, you need to be on a farm somewhere, okay? Well, not, I, I, not 100 yards from the uptown area. Okay. You know, again, not to interfere again, I, I just don't know what a fifth time is going to do. I, I have a, I mean, my feeling is people would probably vote for. I mean, the worst thing you want is for us to all of a sudden now vote against. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I guess, can't my, go to city council. I, I would continue to pursue it at city council. Where well, but they've already in. asked Mr. Mm -hmm. Smeltzer to come back to the planning commission. And actually, it was, uh, if I, and you can certainly reach out to her to find out. I think it was Christine. Christine, uh, who, who is in attendance today. I don't know if she, she, yeah, she's Yeah, I think she was the speaking. one that said something to Mr. Smelter. I know he's been communicating with somebody on council, and right. they said take it back to the Planning Commission. So that's, so that's what he did. He's the one that brought it back to you again. So, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think it's unfortunate that it has to be heard a fifth time or acted upon a fifth time. I think that's unfortunate because there certainly is better things to do with your time than hear this for five times. Can I ask Christine, as long as she's in the sure. audience, what the what the council's concerns were that they're kicking this back to the Planning Commission? I, there's, um, there's issues about the fact that council is, a lot of people on council are new. You know, a lot of the people who are on it have never seen this proposal. Um, Council is also uncomfortable. Um, they like to act upon recommendations from the Planning Commission. I've tried bringing certain things before Council and they have said we need recommendation so that they can act on it. And that's but part have, of but four recommendations. recommendations are already there. <laughs> <laughs> but also the fact that um, it has, we had no planner. And that was my main concern, is that the four recommendations came from planning commissions um, without the input of our new planner. And um, I, that's so that the issue with the increase in the density that's already occurred there, um, and it would be the most up-to-date because we've had building go on, um, and the recommendations from the planner. And so to bring it all up to the most current, because the other recommendations d weren't, you know, didn't necessarily cover and look at what's already gone on there. Um, also, with some of the infrastructure development that went on with uh, with Carpenter and such, um, I I don't necessarily think it's very good policy to to look at something that's you know three or four years old and, and make policy on it. And I think that. It would make sense for all the information to be updated and to be presented to council because a lot of the members of council are new since this last proposal went through from the planning commission. And you know, um, I mean, we I could try. I one reason is I talk to council members individually about this, um, as you know, and they said many of them said I'd like to hear what the planning commission has to say. So, I mean, I could try it again, and it may decide, they may say, we don't have enough information and we feel uncomfortable about bringing it, so. And I can assure you that's the last thing that Mr. Smeltzer and I want to hear, is that you don't have enough information. Uh, Mr. Logue, uh, since you're the... Please, uh, yeah. Do you have some thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I mean, if the, if this the is planning, what I've been waiting for. <laughs> if the Planning Commission would uh, request a memo from me or something, I would certainly, I would be happy to give them uh, a detailed recommendation. Offhand, my recommendation, yeah, is to have it rezoned as B2D. I do not see what the, I do not see enough negatives to it to be swayed against that. I do think that, I guess my, my real opinion is if you've got, a parking deck that close and you have on-street parking meters mm -hmm. uh, for commercial businesses I don't if a if a business does not want to provide parking for commercial purposes I don't see why they should be re required to and that would go from mr. smelter or anybody else 
uh, I believe the Board of Zoning Appeals in 2003 awarded a variance for 40 parking spaces for Casa Nueva. Uh, I don't see how those 40 parking spaces variances have been. I don't see how that would impact. be legal to do a variance for that. What's that? I, it doesn't seem like that would be should be permitted for a variance if it's specifically stated not to. That seems like that was an opinion and not actual. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if we need the memo so much as city council needs to receive the memo. Well, I can, like I said, I can give it to council or I can give it to the planning commission and they can, you guys can follow my lead or, right. or not follow my lead and go forward with it. <clears throat> I would say give it to us right now. Okay. We'll, we'll, shoot, we'll okay. review yeah. the stuff, shoot it to council, okay. and, and let them right. start. Okay, so, well, because the thing that we're trying to stress is that though the people's faces change of who's on mm -hmm. the planning commission, we have to have a history in it. I mean, I know we're all different, but we, you know, I guess my there question has to be a continuation with those four votes that they still. What's sustain. your name? My name's Nicholas, sorry. Nicholas, my, I guess my question to you is this. It seems like you're reluctant to actually take a vote on this issue for the fifth time. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, just like city council's got new faces. I, I feel like it doesn't sort of validate the, our previous votes and it makes, it sort of waters down each time we do a vote on something. But that, what I don't want to see have happen is the letter of recommendation goes from Paul to you. You hand it to council. Council turns around and says, yeah, but we still haven't heard from the Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. So what does it hurt to let the new members of the Planning Commission take a vote? Mm -hmm. Okay, what's it hurt? We certainly spent 30 minutes, you know, beating up something <laughs> right before this, you know. Right. Take five minutes beating this up, okay? Well, I, like I said, I, I'm just I acting as chairperson. I'm reluctant to, to bring a vote as a motion, but any of the other commissioners are more than welcome to bring that motion. Up. I don't mind taking a vote on it, but I would prefer uh, not to vote on it today and, okay. and see more information because this is the first time then that this has been brought up to me since uh, I've been sitting here. So Mr. Logue will give you his recommendation and you guys will discuss it and then we'll wait to hear back from you then. Absolutely. Is that fair enough? Okay. I think so. That's fine. I mean, we're not under any timeline. We just, we would just like to see it continue to move forward. All right. Just since That's night. fine. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. May I make a suggestion as well? Mm -hmm. Please. Just, since uh, John is our zoning and director, he may want to. I will work with John as well to get the to get a, to get his two cents on whether this should be rezoned as well. He's a. If we're talking about rezonings. It, should not just be the planner discussing that. It should probably be our zoning enforcer. So. Okay. Fair enough. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Um, thank you, John Warren. Um, next item of communication is a request from City Council, another one, um, to amend or remove section prohibit uh, section <coughs> on code prohibiting vegetable gardening. Um, and we do have a document on that very such uh, change. Did City Council provide this document? Or? Um, a citizen did. Okay. Uh, there's a group, uh, CFI, and some other uh, interested parties. I think uh, the drafts actually, were, well, I, there's actually two drafts you can see in place there. One was sent directly to me. Uh, because there was a conversation I had with somebody, believe it or not, at the farmer's market. Okay. It didn't change much from the other uh, draft concerning uh, gardening. Okay, I'll, I'll read the uh, second draft aloud then. Okay. Um, it's a proposal to amend the other city code sections uh, to amend 240401 R1 residential zone, one family, as follows. C, conditionally permitted uses, the following uses shall, uses shall be permitted only if expressly authorized by the Board of Zoning Appeals, hereinafter referred to as BZA, in accordance with provisions of this code. Uh, item three, they would remove gardening and capitalize domestic animals and also remove the raising of vegetables, fruits, or flowers. Um, so that would just uh, pertain to domestic animals. So domestic animals, the keeping of domestic animals not for sale of property. Item four would be commercial gardening, the raising of vegetables, fruits, or flowers for sale. 
Um, then uh, following suit would be 230402 for R2 residential zone, 230403 for R3 residential zone. Uh, these don't need to be remended because they've referenced that 230401 uh, for ex exclusion and retain all other conditions. They go on to say uh, that this would allow non-commercial gardening to be considered an implied permitted accessory use, which I'm not sure if it's implied if it's not stated. I thought we already had that discussion once in commission, that if it's, it's not allowed if it's not permitted, if, it, if it's not listed. Said if it wasn't stated, it was allowed. Well, remember, this issue item came up, uh, I'm, not, I'm just sure if RJ you were on here, but it, um, about homeless shelters not being a permitted use because it was never listed as such a use. So I don't know if that would be of the are, same sort of... But they are called out in our code. As uh, I can never say that word. Um, in the... Uh, the it old was very, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something of that nature. What was it again? It, Honestly, you don't not, you don't remember offhand. I, I don't have it. Okay. Right. Give me the code. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna need leave nothing unanswered today. Okay. So you want to have a section you want to talk about? Uh, I I'm not sure which. I think it would have been. I, I can't. Maybe, uh, Paul, do you remember where this came up? I thought it was homeless shelters. Maybe I'm wrong. Or it was hostels. I thought it was hostels. Hostels, I believe. Yeah. Oh, wow, that was a while ago. It was, but that, that's where it this was, discussion came from of what I thought it was a, as, a, as a use. So, therefore, I thought it was, my argument was I thought it was allowed, but I thought legally you have to define it if it's a uh, permitted use. Yeah, I'd have to check our minutes on that, but that familiar. Institutions. So, homeless shelters are allowed, uh, if anyone Yeah, basically that's supposed to be... Uh, you pronounce it Helio. Helio. What is it again? Homeless shouters. Helio Masonary. Okay, yes. Yeah. And, okay. So I, I guess, yeah, that. All right, I, let but me continue and we'll go back to that. Yeah, it was hostels, is okay. what the, where that came from. Um, yeah. Speaking of the history of the Planning Commission. Um, Number two was to ret uh, item for them was to retain consistency across all <laughs> sections by amending 910 or section 9.10.02 as follows to add stronger language to address untended yards. Um, Noxious weeds, grass to be cut. Every owner responsible for maintenance of any lot or land within the city shall be required to cut all noxious weeds. They would remove grass or other types of vegetation other than trees or shrubs and grass would be an addition, growing or being upon the lots of land as aforesaid by cutting to a height not over eight inches. Any growth of such noxious weeds, removing grass or other vegetation other than trees or shrubs, other than such height or reaching maturity, maturity and to remove line. And then adding to that, where grass over such height is hereby declared a nuisance. Garden and landscape plantings that are maintained and trimmed as necessary to prevent overgrowth and blight are not subject to the eight inch height requirement. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, okay, I can see why they're, they're paired together because the concept is you could have a real scraggly garden right. or a lot of weeds and noxious plants and say, this is my garden. Uh, on the other hand, I will point out that section 91002 is actually outside zoning code and council can do this without our Mm -hmm. uh, to say so, a recommendation. Even. Right, so it goes just tw Title 24. Yeah. And 41, we could also get a little. Okay, and the thrust of this is, to, uh, again, is coming from the Community Foods Initiative. Uh, I think uh, the conversation was, I think, with Kent Butler at one point, too, yeah. concerning uh, home gardening, domestic gardening, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I gave you copies, you should have copies of the 1992 Athens City Code. It's the one scribbled up with all these little uh, pieces in there. Mm -hmm. I will point out the first, uh, second column uh, under R1 bullet number four, mm -hmm. agriculture and nurseries. This was deleted in 90, somewhere late 90s because it really was talking about nurseries and greenhouses and general farming, including, not including commercial, provided they are on a track not less than five acres. At that point, they were saying there aren't enough five acre plots to worry about. On the other side, though, uh, the second uh, paragraph down, or rather the first paragraph down, gardening and farm animals, this was the actual section for the non-commercial use. So you can see where both sections were kind of um, 
changed and modified to what we have presently. All right, she moved over to this, and it was in 92 already a, a permitted use, it was or a, was it a conditional use at that point? It was a permitted accessory use okay. as gardening at that time, I believe. Is that what it says? Yes, mm -hmm. it was. Um, yeah, yes. that's what it was. Okay. So you can see where it shifted it down a little bit to make it conditional where it required zoning board appeals. Um, and again, um, if you if you look at all this scribbling, that's when I was on zoning board appeals, so I was aware of some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But we really never had that as a problem on zoning board appeals in terms of gardening. Mm -hmm. I think where the um, the conditions, the, the the call that they're making, the the draftees of this amendment, is that they don't want to require somebody to say, I want a, a garden. And I have to go to zoning board appeals to do this. Right. Um, and again, it comes down to the, the commercial part uh, was amended to put in a second draft because I was saying, okay, how do you how do you prevent commercial gardening from taking place in our zone? Um, and one, the counter argument, of course, is commercial gardening is commercial and therefore it's a business, and in our zone you can't have it. Mm -hmm. So this is trying to bridge both uh, arguments along the way. And it, again, it comes along with the, the push to being having a, a sustainable city or transition cities with has you know resource of, uh, of both food, um, you know, and where where our food comes from. I guess um, that's that's the conversation I've had with citizens about this. I don't know what else I could add. No, I don't. I don't know if there's. I guess I would see my recommendation would be to bring it, it again. It's going back to the future and putting it back as a permitted accessory use, like in 1992. But with guard, I guess extracting the gardening part and adding in. Uh, let's go real quick. So nine item um, of the permitted accessory uses that would be gardening, regarding the raising of fruits or uh, vegetables or fruits for the use of personal enjoyment of residents and premises and not for commercial purposes would need to be, I would think it would need to be in the permitted accessory uses and not just pulled out of the conditional. Okay. Um, if this were to be accepted, I would, I would think you'd want to have that explicitly stated. And again, maybe I'm wrong. And maybe there is a reading that it's implied, but I don't think so. I would assume not, but just because we, well, Based on our past discussion, yeah. someone could tell me otherwise, and I'll be I'll tell, be total agreement with that. But just I, I hate to throw a new wrinkle into it, and I mentioned it to the mayor that the remaining part then would be domestic animals, the keeping of domestic animals not for sale on a property. Basically, you'd have to have to go to BZA to own a dog, and an R1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean that's that's it's part absolutely of the, true. Though. That's how <laughs> yeah. it's written today. That's how it's written already, and I think we're going to do this just take care of the whole thing at once and maybe we work on rewriting something and putting it back in under permitted uses and rewrite it and go from there in regards to gardens and domestic animals. Hmm. That's a very good point. I would have a concern too about the commercial aspects um, because I think that brings a uh, some different factors in as far as like when commercial does that mean I could come into somebody's onto somebody's property basically drive up in an R1 and make a transaction right there in which case you're talking about traffic that's coming in and dealing on a commercial basis with the with the gardening that somebody's doing mm -hmm. um, the other thing just out of uh, um, would the gardening be restricted to uh, Backyards or fronts of the property. And I ask that in regards to fencing, um, because if you're having a garden, and you have deer, raccoon, whatever coming in, uh, you want protection for your garden. Are people with this going to ask? Um, about basically, board. an amendment on on fencing in the front yard. That, that's well, already happening. That. that was one of the things that I had. That I was going to discuss is the R1 areas and the outlying areas that do have front yards and fences already up. Right. That obviously yeah, I mean, out of town is a little different than in city as right. far as the front yard fences. But I've had experience with uh, neighbors across the street, well, not in Athens, but in another community where basically uh, they began to operate commercial activity out of their home that required customers to come to their property and make the transaction and 
you had a lot of, of, of increased traffic on that street, and that would be a concern that I would have. I think there are other sections of code that prohibit businesses in R1 zones. I mean, you can have professional businesses of some right. sort. You can have home businesses, right. but they take only a certain amount of square footage. I think... Um, but yeah. as long as this is consistent with that. Yeah, yeah so is the argument, in a way, should, should it be made that you can't? In an R1, there should be. Why, why do we even have the commercial gardening as a conditionally promoted if, if the R1 zone explicitly stays, you can't have a commercial? Right. If you're just talking about self-sustainment, um, you know, domestic gardening for your own uh, pleasure, you know, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I had, again, the reservation about the con commercial aspect. Okay, uh, again, uh, by referring to the old 92 law, yeah, you, uh, we're, kind of, right. we're kind of muddling it because really what the thrust of this amendment is to get, uh, get it out of the, the area that you, every gardener who has a guard, backyard garden has to go in front of the zoning board of appeals to get a garden going. Right. Um, the next question, of course, when does it, you know, if it goes into commercial grade gardening, then in theory, uh, the, the way the, uh, the proponents of this or this change once would that would kick in your commercial, you're running a business, to have an R1 on there for you, that's prohibited. Um, and you'd have to get a variance for that of some right. sort. Right. I mean, that's what it's stating, indicating, you're saying these would only be allowed the dog that we all have or commercial gardening if they got the variance from. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it's, a, it's, well a, it's almost the other way, and then we almost really need the gardening and the permitted uses, and then there shouldn't even be any mention of the, of the commercial as a variance then, as a variance option. And I, I just bring that up in terms of giving uh, the, the BZA, you know, added, I don't know, uh, guidance, isn't guidance in, the, in the issue. Hmm. Well... Okay. I think it needs some work. <laughs> I don't know if we want to, I guess, is there anyone on council that wants to try to, or on council, commission, I apologize, uh, that would want to, uh, I know council doesn't want to take anything up, uh, but would want to work on trying to adapt this to what I'll, we see, I'll, or does it go back to maybe? I'll go back to the, the original. Seems like they're interested. I yes, guess. I, I, I've had discussions with the, with the people who wrote this up on, mm -hmm. on many occasions. Um, some of you probably know some of the people, like yeah. uh, I think Rhonda Clark, CFI, okay. as well as Kent Butler Kent as well. Butler. So, um, I, again, I think um, the alternative, as you say, is to move the section into the permitted accessory uses, and just mm -hmm. and that's one way to avoid it. Um, we could take the old wordage, we could take the new wordage, commercial can be in and out, provided we're aware of the, and again, the commercial part I think is good because there will come a question where somebody's saying, okay, right, I've I got a garden. Mm -hmm. um, there have been cases where somebody has a garden and they end up there at the farmer's market in the booth and it's like, okay, now they're commercial. You know? right. mm -hmm. Even though they're not selling on property, they're, mm -hmm. they're now growing production mm -hmm. right. level right. crops. And that's something that the BZA would probably be made aware of, and that maybe would help in okay. their decision. I'll, I'll try getting back to these people before the next meeting, no guarantees. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a task for me. And um, again, the other part is to look at the noxious weeds section, too, and make sure we have some kind of, um, you know, look, this they're trying to do is because you had occasions, uh, if, if you look at, I think, the minutes from the packet from the uh, B2D section there, which I, I somehow don't have. Um, I, there's a section of minutes in there where they discussed the fact that there were people being cited for sunflowers in their front yard because it was over eight inches. Right. Uh, okay, so that's one of the issues you have there is that we want to put some kind of, you know, uh, there's a push also to get away from lawn, lawns that require lawnmowers. And right. I can see where they start talking about that, but then it becomes, you know, that word blight in there is going to be one of the problems right there. It's, a very, it's very subjective. Yes. Is, wild, <laughs> is wild grass a plant or a noxious weed? Uh, I've had people call up and say the bamboo is a, is a grass, technically, and therefore should be no longer than higher than eight inches. Right. And we have some good stands of bamboo in this town. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, the question arises is what, you know, when does that fall into? Uh, you know, office. Right. I remember that discussion being at a, a former city I, I lived in where bamboo was qualified as a grass. So then the neighbor went out and cut everything razor sharp. After that, the city no longer said, it's fine, grow it out. <laughs> so, little points on it, huh? I, I could see some, uh, see some <laughs> residents, unfortunately, <laughs> the that would do that. We'd also uh, garden location. 
uh, be in your discussions as well? Um, or at least how gardens are treated differently in a front yard as they would be in a I, I can bring that up. I don't think they were looking at that. They, they mostly look at uh, where this is coming from is where the sunshine is for most of these people. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, locations in terms of setback, okay. Yeah, I, I think most of us would be, I, I don't know, I, I know personally I'd be fine if it's in front of the back, but it, again, it, it has to do with then, well, you might not be able to have a fence in the front or that sort of thing, but. Yeah, and I don't the see why they should get an exemption on the fence level right. and somebody who's not planting a garden mm -hmm. uh, still has to. People have come for variances on fences to the BZA. So uh, technically, if they were trying to get a, a front garden in the front, which they're allowed to have, and then they want a fence, then they might have to go to the BZA on that. And then the question, of course, fencing usually has to, a lot of times fencing has to do with actually um, uh, line of sight issues with the, with the road. Mm -hmm. I think that's one reason why you see a lot of fence restrictions on there. Right, but if somebody's also oh. using just like cheap wire oh, yeah. and stringing it around <laughs> the yard. Electric fence maybe too? Electric fence, you never know. Yeah. Be, they use Somebody <laughs> uses <bottom> wire. <laughs> chicken, chicken wire or whatever. We really don't have, to my knowledge, any, t um, I think that was brought up during the comprehensive plan many years ago, is that we should have some kind of uh, fence legislation in place. Uh, having sat on the steering committee for the comprehensive plan, because right now we have no difference between a, a pressure treated fence, a cyclone fence, or a bob wire, or electric. Um, you know, a fence is a fence is a fence. Um, and I, there's no real, to my knowledge, there's no criteria within the code. At this no, point. and I agree with that. We need to do something on that. You know, so that's another project for us eventually as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay. You want to take that on? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Looking for work? That's it, absolutely. <laughs> Looking for volunteers myself. Okay, well, uh, if you would send that forward and maybe uh, Shark could copy you on those minutes and that would, you don't need to do as much talking. Okay. Minutes can do. Talking for talking him. Talking for him. I uh, appreciate that. Um, do, if we have no other communications, um, any further discussion from anyone on the communications? Janet. Okay. Uh, Quickly, uh, meetings or uh, any report from the city planner or a director? Quickly? Quick. You know, <laughs> usually you're quick. I knew today you're going to have a full I will, plate. I it's will, been like three, two months since we've seen I will try to so. keep it short. I That's do fine. have just a few things. Uh, I don't, did you guys have this yet, the planning commissioners? I think we have one. I didn't know. I don't know so if that's that an update. It looks so Just so you guys have it. Thank you. And then I do have for. For Nicholas, RJ, and Harry, I have copies of the new floodplain regulations, Title 25, with, um, and for the mayor and the certain safety director, I just have a brief memo summarizing the changes that have been made to the floodplain regulations so that everybody is aware of what they are. The Planning Commission, as an entity, <clears throat> does not have oversight over the floodplain regulations. Uh, but I did, since uh, the five of you do make significant decisions on land use practices and development, that you guys are just aware of these changes and how they could impact developments, mm -hmm. how they impact neighborhoods, communities, et cetera. Um, there are, if you look at the bottom, it says there's key changes to Title 25, and then I've described each one of those. The, the main changes are in relation to compensatory storage, in our 20 and 50 year floodplains, which we do have mapped uh, and certified by an engineer. Um, those require that we cannot import fill dirt into the 20 and the 50 year floodplains without what's called compensatory storage, which means if you bring dirt in to fill it up, then you have to remove dirt from somewhere else to make up for any changes in flows and flooding so that you're not basically pushing flooding issues out onto your neighbor's properties. Um, pretty much standard stuff on that. Hey, how does that, real quickly, how does that work? Is, do you have to do that within your own lot or could you do it <clears throat> elsewhere along the path? Uh, what it says is in the 20 year, the volume shall be offset by providing an equal or greater volume of permanent flood storage by excavation or other compensatory measures 
at a hydraulically connected site, which is preferably two adjacent to okay. or on the opposite side of the stream across from the development okay. area. Cool. So the key is that it's hydraulically connected. Okay. So there is some there is some room in there. Okay. Uh, there's also other solutions and better practices for development and for construction that don't require the importation of fill. Mm -hmm. uh, you can build you can elevate using stilts and have parking underneath your building. We've right. seen uh, there's a property on Mill Street that has done that. Uh, three unit uh, rental property where they have parking underneath that would be mm -hmm. uh, an acceptable practice okay. uh, that meets these requirements uh, the other major change is with the definition of substantial improvement uh, not to get into it too much but this is um, this impacts any building that was built in Athens in our floodplain prior to March of 1980 which is when the original flood flood maps were provided by FEMA to the city of Athens uh, those properties are grandfathered in. Most of them are not above the base flood elevation for a 100-year flood. So if a, if a flood hits, those properties are going to have significant damage to them uh, as part of the requirement. Also, when if you're doing improvements to a property like that, FEMA's requirement is that if you're doing an improvement that, ex that hits 50% of that building's value, in order to get a permit to develop in that floodplain, you must bring the building up to up to modern standards for the flood elevations. Um, they do allow you to do, if you're doing improvements at 50, less than 50%, you are allowed to do that. Our regulations um, allow you to, to do 50% every five years. So you can't come to me today and say, I've got a building worth 100,000, it was built in 1960, I'm gonna do $50,000 worth of improvements to it but I'm not going to bring it up to elevation. So now you've got a building worth 150000 And then in 2010, come to me and say you're going to do $75,000 worth of improvements and still basically not bring it into conformance. And so that's been addressed in the new flood regulations. And then the final key change is in relation to critical facilities uh, can are prohibited in the 20-year floodplain and existing critical facilities within the 20-year are allowed to to have standard maintenance necessary to continue their operations. So that would address something like, um, you know, hospitals, uh, police, fire, emergency, anything like that, Red Cross shelters, something like that would not be able to be built in the 20 year floodplain. And that's just sound management uh, to make sure that the critical facilities that we would need in a flooding event are not actually flooded out so they cannot provide those services to us. Yes. Um, I assume that eventually, if it isn't already, the uh, the maps for 20 and 50 and 100, I know the 100's on the GIS, will the 20 and 50's end up at there as well? Or? We are waiting. Yeah, we, we, we will be putting those up on the city GIS website. Okay. We do not actually have the new 100 and 500 up on the GIS website. We do have that. We have maps available for people to review online as PDFs. Uh, the, but they have not been provided to us, uh, especially that 500 years, so that we can get that information out because they, the official date for the new maps is not until December. So we don't have those up yet, but they are coming. Thanks. Yeah. And as well as the 20 and the 50, and we have elevations, elevation lines for the 20 and the 50 that we will be putting those up as well. Okay. So other than that exciting piece of news, I did have just I wanted to give you guys a brief that the bicycle and pedestrian plan uh, is coming along very well. We did have a public meeting on it about two weeks ago. Seventy people, I believe, came for that public meeting. We had an uh, incredible amount of data that was collected and points of view that were extremely helpful. We will have a follow-up preliminary plan presentation, I believe, on November 12th at 7 p.m. at the community center. Uh, I'll probably be talking about that in about a month or so or in a couple weeks with you guys just to give you more detail on it. Um, the Andy Stone met with Bart Kassler, who is the developer for the laundromat project on North Carpenter Street or North Lancaster, whichever. Uh, he met with him and they have worked out a arrangement for the access concern that the Planning Commission uh, gave them on their Title 41. That was one of the requirements to actually begin the project was that uh, they meet with Andy Stone and work out an access management plan. Andy has worked that, that out with them. He will be following up shortly 
to the Planning Commission with uh, more detail on that. So, and we do have a few Title 41 projects that will be coming before the Planning Commission in the next month. Okay. Uh, likely at least one at the 21st. Uh, Tony Farian, Castle Brook Properties. I do have a copy of uh, site plans for all of you that I'll give you at the end of the meeting. Okay. So that's it. Right. Any questions for the plan? <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, John, did you have any um, I just want to let you know, about a month ago, I met with the State of Ohio Department of Industrial uh, Compliance, uh, sat down with the Executive Secretary of the Board of Building Standards, uh, Administrative Assistant of Code Development, and the uh, Supervisor of Plans Examining, talked to them about our fire suppression versus fire separation regs and what we can do. Um, We've had some Title 41 projects that we talked about trying to require them to put fire suppression in. Mm -hmm. Finding out that uh, we probably cannot really require that, it is a conflict of the building code, even though it is coming from the chief that is more stricter, that it is still in conflict with the code, so therefore we cannot really enforce that. Mm -hmm. But what we are able to do is start looking at duplexes and triplexes in a little different way through our department if on separation and uh, it's kind of lengthy as to details of that but uh, I think this will suffice in a lot of ways of what we were trying to accomplish with the spreading of fire and, and I have sat down with a number of the architectural firms in town already and discussed with them what we're going to do and require upon submittal to uh, see that that separation is there and uh, even though we're not a required or an authorized building department yet, the state does say we do have the authorization to require those submittals to prove that they are separated. Because okay. if they are not separated, then they can be classified as a commercial structure of six people or more and therefore having to go through state building permit process. So That's great. That's good news. And then uh, two other things, both in regards to signs, maybe you don't want to hear them. <laughs> uh, the sandwich board situation uptown. Uh, passed out the flyers last Friday, or a week ago Friday. We had 18 sandwich boards on Court Street that, uh, to my knowledge, every one of them has taken them in, supposed to have, and are, as of right now, complying with what we've requested. And, uh, and then the other issue, which... Uh, I don't know exactly which way we pursue. Maybe we have to write something up. Is the one section in our code with the temporary signs in the B3 district, uh, primarily for strip malls. Um, we've got a concern that we're coming across in our office with people coming in and wanting temporary signs for, out on East State Street, for example. Um, on a strip mall, if there's eight businesses in there, if a person comes in and wants to apply for temporary signs, how many can they have? Basically, it's to the point where Market on East State could have 200 temporary signs out front, or if somehow we got to put a number on this and get a control and maybe a maximum number of temporary signs that's allowed by one tenant within a building, Paul. something to that effect. Sorry. Um, Paul? Um, okay, again, if it's if my memory is correct, and I, I'd have to go back and look at this type of stuff, um, a sign, temporary sign, can be no larger or bigger than the uh, the size, the full size sign. Correct. Okay, so um, you're uh, what you're asking is whether a tenant of an, uh, a build uh, a mall can well, actually have an individual sign. sign. Two by two. That's a four foot four square foot sign they can have 25 of those signs is it per tenant or is it going to be per the whole building since the building has multiple tenants mm -hmm. and if it's for the each tenant if there's eight tenants in it, you can have 200 signs there <laughs> which obviously none of us want mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to think of a way to, to maybe we put a, a maximum number of signs per tenant on a or in those uses right now it's it's pretty big as to what we can do we've, we've got a, a one right now that's okay in theory though let's say i'm looking okay market um market on, on state street for instance that has one large sign and it's got all the tenants listed on that sign mm -hmm. and really that's all they can have they can have no, they, this, have, they can have a temporary signs as well one large temporary one time for a sign other than including the freestanding sign, which they've got, they could also have temporary sign. But that would be that one entity, the one 
shopping mall okay, no. okay as a premise the entire premise which then mm -hmm. correct it would be a total of 100 square feet in that situation divide okay. that by four square feet i know this is kind of <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we had a little bit of this discussion when we were talking about real estate science. Um, I think the classic is the one, uh, College Apartments, I think it is, by Hungry Howie's there, has at least four or five, um, it's condominiums. Mm -hmm. It's got four or five um, real estate signs stuck in the front of the building because right. every condominium is a mm -hmm. house unto its own. So that we're, we're seeing it on that side too, I think. So maybe it's something we have to look at. It's, in, it's in something I want to bring up and think about. Does, okay. does somebody like College Park have a Homeowners Association? Probably do. Because, I mean, can you oh. treat that kind of a situation much then it's as the mall? Park, that one there? Yeah, okay. as much as you would the mall, where basically you have one representative. If you've got for sale, you know, then it has to come through the Homeowners Association. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, uh, University Commons is, is similar in nature as far as being able to purchase, and they don't seem to have that problem. No. And they have basically they deal through the one realtor that that works out of University Commons. Mm -hmm. So you know maybe is the answer is to um, the homeowners association of any uh, mm -hmm. establishment residents like that is is to put them in control of you know the signage. Mm -hmm. And this includes business as well. Yeah. yeah, I guess it would encourage either if you're going to be a mall, you have to act as one and one sort of identity and if you don't like it that way then you would try to go away from the mall and be a sort of your own mm -hmm. sort of persona or something like that. Now what I what I'm not quite sure is who applies for a temporary sign? Is it the like if you is it the tenant or the person that owns the property? The tenant. So then it's yeah, so the t so all a bunch of individual tenants could apply for the sign but it, we can only give them one. So who you know, is it the first one out of the gate gets the temporary <laughs> sign, or you know, I mean, that's where I don't know if it really is the tenant, or if it shouldn't it be the that, owner? That's why I said yeah. I did it. somehow maybe we need to look at that <laughs> on that part. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right, that's that's a good one. Anything else, John? No. All right. Well, maybe when we're in a more giving spirit around the holidays, we bring up the <laughs> sign <laughs> or dances. Okay. Uh, just, Sorry. Uh, next opportunity for citizen speak. I don't think there's anyone uh, that has lasted the meeting for that. Um, announcements and other business. First, uh, next meeting is October 21st at uh, noon. Any other items? Um, I believe the city council is talking about having a public hearing um, next, not next Monday, but not Monday after, which would be the 19th, I think, concerning when we talk about the changes at that. Uh, the letter changing between B2 to B2, B3 to B2, uh, they were going to have a public hearing on that uh, before the regular session of city council. Okay. So that would be at 7. And I just want to relay it because it does relate to what we're doing. Absolutely. And we just looked at it as a kind of a typo. But right. Other than that, nothing else. Okay. RJ? No, DJ. Oops. Okay. Um, disposition of the minutes from last week, or last week, I should say, July. two months July. ago. <laughs> um, I move with the accept the minutes. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No question. Right. I would like to say a comment, though. Mm -hmm. I would like to see, I'm looking at my notes from the July 15th meeting last time, and there was quite a bit more detail that was provided, in, uh, particularly in the planner's report. I guess I'd just like to ask for a little bit more additional, mm -hmm. not to make it too cumbersome, but he actually identified some of the highest volume for the pet and bike plan areas, and, and I just didn't see it related to that. Yeah, I mean, I, and the other thing is, if you had anything, you know, if you had uh, on the reports, if something was prepared, you know, um, as well that would be of use to the commission, you could always submit that as well, and that could be part of the minutes. But otherwise, you know, it could just sure. be some that shark and cover, so. Very good. All right. Uh, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All right. Any opposed? Yeah. Thank you.